Hey friends, it is the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host. My friend Amelia is back. How is school going? School is great. Um, I've personally been struggling <laughs> with, with a few things. Okay. I've been finding myself feeling very sad when I'm not usually a very sad person. Hmm. And I just recently had a panic attack and I'm not even sure why I did it okay. just happened and I was like okay maybe there's something maybe there's something else going on here a little deeper all right so um because this is this is a a big topic we're gonna maybe split it up in just a couple little things first um let's let's maybe try and define um sad now you used you said you had a panic attack for the very first time um that this is a new experience I'm guessing yeah yeah Definitely. All right. So like, because like we there's there's lots of ways to talk about sad and sad is actually a normal range of human emotion. And if you never, ever felt sad, like this is actually a concerning thing. Um, there are some things that that should make you sad and you recognize it even just theologically, simply in the fact Jesus cried like that, that Jesus wept means sad is open and access to you. It is a godly emotion that you will sometimes feel because things are wrong down here. And you're allowed to feel sad for it. There's also sort of emotions like melancholy, which means like you just feel down. You you have hard time getting energy to do things. Um, and, and then there's there's actually talk about depression, which is a, a physiological thing that that actually happens. It, it is a chemical thing that that means it's real. And, and the feelings that that you have are are things that that you're allowed to address and not just sort of shrug off because you can actually point to chemicals and say this is a thing that is happening right now. And that also changes how Christians especially deal with it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so because we, we said panic attack, um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about this as if it's a real thing. And by by that, I, I mean that some of the, the Christian things that we tell each other to do are not helpful. We'll say, you know, you just need to read the Bible more, or you just need to pray more, or just go to church more. The word more is indicative of something. Um, if I tell you more is involved, are we using law vocabulary or gospel vocabulary? What do you think? Law, it always makes me feel like I'm not enough or I'm not doing enough. Yeah, this is the problem with the word more. More is 100% in the, in the law because if it's the gospel, it's enough. Like what does Jesus do that is, is, is needing more of? Like, did he die? And he's like, it is finished, but like, add some more to it. <laughs> or, or he says, your sins are forgiven, but like, add some more to it. When, when, he, <laughs> when he feeds you his body and he, his blood is like, this is, this is like a toe worth. You're going to have to come back for some more. Um, no, like he says, this is my body. It forgives your sins. You are, you are a child of God. It is finished. Everything is, is absolute in totality for you over and over and over again to address the fact that in this world, in the law, there's always more. And that means that when you sort of direct somebody who is acutely aware of their shortcomings because of the law to more of the law, it, it tends to exacerbate the problem. Yeah. I've, I've directly experienced that. I've, I've talked to other people here and they come with a, a more of a perspective of we have to fix it ourselves in a sense of everything. And so their response to me was, you should read the Bible more. And I was just like, I mean, so it's true, but like also I should sin less and I'm trying, but like here I am in, in this. And if all Jesus had is is try harder, then honestly, Jesus' religion is, it, it's horribly complex for no particular reason because like you don't actually need Jesus to tell somebody to be kind to a stranger. Like, have you yeah. noticed that like other people who are not Christians can can be nice people by and large? The, if, if, <laughs> yeah. All it is is to, to sort of chase happiness and be kind. You don't need Jesus. And, and honestly, Jesus is is completely discontent with that kind of thing too because you're still going to meet the thing that makes him cry, which is death. Jesus weeps over the tomb of Lazarus because something is actually wrong here. And the law does a great job of pointing out what's wrong, but the law does a terrible job of fixing it because the law tells you how things are supposed to be. And if you can't get from here to how things are supposed to be, well, then you're going to need something to actually put you there. And that's, that's a gospel thing. So it, it kind of brings me to the next thing I kind of want to talk about when somebody is struggling with, with depression, with especially the, these, these feelings of, of, of completely being overwhelmed that leave you in that panic attack where you're gasping for breath and you just, everything is impossible to deal with right now. Um, one of the things that we try and do is we downplay the law. 
and by that, I mean, we use platitudes. We, we will talk to each other like, it's not so bad. It, it's not as big of a deal as you think. Like, you can do it. Um, we, we come up with all of these things that we say to each other. But maybe it, it might actually be fair to not downplay the law and say that if everything seems completely overwhelming, it is. If, if, if ever, everything is so terrifying that you can't breathe, that's because there's a lot wrong down here. And ignoring it doesn't actually solve it. We get a magnified view of the law that we're actually supposed to have in the catechism. Like Luther doesn't sort of say like, don't worry about that whole murdering thing so much. It's just stabbing. Instead, he says, we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. Like he leans into it. He magnifies the anxiety, the worry, the depression that, that, that sort of comes from the fact that I can't do all of this. But it's not to leave us in the law, but it's actually to point us then to the gospel. And that that gospel is simply over and over and over again, completely apart from how you feel. Did Jesus die? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Is, is Jesus risen? Yes or no? Yes. So it's not, can I make you think about the things that are wrong less, but, but also can I make you address them in light of the cross and the empty tomb more? I, I actually, what what does Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead have to do with the fact that there are some things wrong in this world that, that I can't fix? Well, it's it's everything because he actually promises a resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And even until I get there, he promises to care for me every single day so much that he says, pray for your daily bread. Pray for your daily bread, even though it's not the, the ultimate, it's not the resurrection, it's not heaven, it's not the perfect picture yet, but I still want to give you daily bread anyway. And even though it doesn't feel like enough, it will be enough to get you through to the bigger thing that that is coming. You're allowed to be discontent with how things look down here. So is Jesus. He cries about it, but he doesn't stop there. And he doesn't just say, pray more. Instead, he says, look at me, look at what I am doing for you. The, the measurement there is, is always enough and never more. Do you, do you sort of see the distinction here? Yeah, I do. And I really liked the distinction that you made between this idea of, oh, downplaying the law and really, because in that sense, I've felt that before. And just, it's almost like trying to analyze it so much and make it okay. And then it's not okay. And then I know this. And then it's this endless cycle of just like, well, I'm stuck in the cycle of, is it okay? No, it's not. But it is okay. Like, I can figure this out. And then I can't. And it's just, it makes the problem worse. Mm -hmm. But then accepting the fact that it's not okay which seems really counterintuitive is actually like the most comforting thing because it recognizes that I can't do it, but there's someone else who did do it for me, which is so cool. <laughs> so this is, this is how we address the first lie the devil tells us when it comes to, to depression, to anxiety, to that, that overwhelming feeling is first that like we can, we can so, sort of address it with the power of positive thinking. Um, and, and like, that that's not a thing. It, it, it's actually a, a chemical that that is is off base sometimes with depression. It it actually is by painting a picture of the law insurmountable. The wages of sin is death, and so you can you can measure this really simply. And I don't mean to just be pessimistic, although I'm really good at it. But like, can you can you create a life that is so perfect that you won't die? And, and if you can't, things are going to go wrong sooner or later. And maybe they're not wrong right now, but sooner or later they will be. And actually, to me, that's freeing. Because now I don't have to just run from what might go wrong eventually. I can say sooner or later something's going to go wrong. But Christ is risen from the grave. And that's what I want to focus on when things are falling apart. That's why when somebody is, is struggling at the last stages of their life and, and they're on a ventilator, when somebody is, is going through, through chemo, when somebody is just honestly going through a daily routine that, that just shouldn't be as overwhelming as it is, but I can't get through it today, the question isn't what, where are you, but, but where is Christ? And and the where right now, the who instead of the how is he going to fix this? It, it, it's so much more powerful because where is God? Well, he's in the word and the sacraments. He's not in heaven just sort of waiting for you to figure it out, but he comes down to you to actually address this over and over and over again because it's not a fix your perspective thing. It's a when you are down, I am here thing. When you are weary, I will give you rest. And so he calls us to, to receive communion, not because we, we just sort of need to keep on building in this world, but because sometimes we are so broke down that all we need is a meal. And, and this, this happens over and over again. But the second lie then that the devil tells us is that this is something that's sort of fixed internally and not from the outside in. So in the same way that the sacraments are, are, are God addressing you because he loves you, this is who he is. 
you can find him in physical places. He puts it, he puts himself in a where for you to find him. It's always from the outside and it's never inside of your heart and outwards to the world, but it's rather outside of your heart for your heart in bread and wine with his word in water with his word in the same way. It's also with people with his word. And so the devil will tell you to fix it yourself in the same way that the devil through the, the scribes and chief priests told Judas to fix it himself when he tries to bring back the silver after betraying the Lord. Like he, and you see just how utterly hopeless it is that, that Judas eventually can't bear that at all. And Lord have mercy, find the rope. Um, but instead, we get to recognize God doesn't say, see to it yourself. He sends you people. And so the idea that you have to fix this yourself is evil. He, he sends you family. He sends you friends. He sends you a pastor. He sends you people that are, are given vocations to help you. And, and that means that, that you are not alone because God wants to care for you, but also that he wants to care for you for, through very specific ways. And, and I say this because this is a hard thing to talk about. Um, it, it, is, it, it, for some reason, feels so embarrassing for Christians to say, I am sad. I am struggling because Christians are supposed to be praising God and everything's fine because that's somehow proof that Christianity is real and not Jesus is risen from the dead. I don't understand that because Paul, he never says like, <laughs> um, if, if I am sad ever, then our faith is in vain. No, he says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain and we are above all to be pitied. Mm. But this is also Paul who genuinely struggles with it sometimes. Like he lays out the things that he went through. And I somehow doubt that in all of it, he was just super chill about it. He said, I know how to be made low. And not just like I was cool with it, but he was made low. You know what low feels like. I know what low feels like. Low doesn't feel high, but like with Jesus. And so telling somebody like rub some Jesus on it, walk it off. It'll be fine. Pray more, read the Bible more. It's, it's evil, but also um, it, it's, it's that you can find God working through specific people. Um, I love my wife more than the doctor does. That's that's probably fair, right? I would hope. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. if my if my doctor ever needed surgery, I should be one with the scalpel, right? Because I love her more. No. Not at all. No. Like no. no. That that's stupid. <laughs> um. So so in in the same way. Um. The the reason that we sort of dance there is we can say it's hard to talk about this. Sometimes it's easier to pick a person who might not have the vocation to help us and sort of put on them the job of helping us. It's especially true of friends. Um, when For me, it was easier to talk to my friends than my parents. It was easier for me to talk to somebody who could sympathize than with my pastor who I was afraid could not. It was terrifying for me to go and talk to a doctor about it. But God actually promises to do something miraculous through a surgeon. See, if you give me a sharp knife and drugs... Like it's, it's not going to go well for anybody. It, there's nothing godly that's going to come of this situation. But the doctor gives the surgeon a sharp knife and drugs. And all of a sudden he cures diseases. Like in ways that would flabbergast the people of Nazareth in the same way that Jesus did. In the same way. God, God works differently through different vocations. He works through your parents to care for you. He might work through a counselor to care for your mind in the same way that he works through your doctor to care through your body. In the same way that he works through your pastor to care for your soul. It, it's important to talk to not just people, but the people who God has promised to work through for this, even though it feels like they might not understand because God has promised to work there. And so it stops being about just what they can do. It actually turns into to what God has promised to do. It, it, it's a glorious thing. And then it might all fall apart, genuinely. And the question goes back to, is Christ still risen from the dead? So yep. then let, let, let's pick it back up and we'll, we'll find a, a a counselor, we'll find a doctor, we'll, we'll keep talking to our parents, but we're also going to, to make sure that, that we're surrounding ourselves with the gifts of God that, that speak, not just do this more, but you are enough. Um, and, and it's a, it's a glorious thing. Are you kind of following me so far? I am. I, I love the idea and no, the fact of that God puts people in our lives and people that he, where he promises to be with their different vocations because that's so tangible and so real when, whereas I feel like there's a lot of times we try to be like, Oh, he just gave me this job, which is great and stuff, but that's why my life is getting better all of a sudden. Now I'm like, I have to be happy because he just gave me this wonderful opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's these like temporal things that we focus on instead of these things where people are put into vocations to help. And I think the the one of parents and pastors is really stark because 
as you said, it's very frightening to talk to people who are in a sense wiser than you and who you feel like maybe never experienced that or maybe are going to think that you're a horrible person. But in reality, that's where their vocation lies is to tell you the gospel and to help you through that. I loved how you compared it with something temporal um, because both of those vocations are ongoing. Like your parents don't just sort of like feed you once and then they're done being parents. Um, <laughs> like even even like as you grow, like your relationship with your folks have changed. We, we've talked about this in a previous podcast. Go check it out. But but also um, your jo- your pastor's job is to give you the same gifts of God over and over again because it's, it's ongoing. That also means that you don't have to measure the victory by whether or not you got better, but by whether or not Christ is risen. That, that, that means you're actually still allowed to, to struggle on the other end. And it's not good to struggle. It hurts to struggle. I hate it. I really, really do. But it also doesn't mean something's broken. It, it, it just means we're not at the resurrection yet. So if you talk to your pastor and he gives you communion and he prays with you and, and you've read the scriptures and all the things that, that, that you know are helpful and you still struggle, that's allowed. Like you, you're, you're allowed to actually struggle. You're allowed to, to still be you, holy, worthy of love and complete because Christ has made you that way and still need more. That's, that's actually how it's going to be this side of the resurrection. And it's, it's just going to continue onward that way because sin breaks stuff. And, and so to, to struggle with depression, to struggle with panic, it's, it's just a recognition that the law is a real thing and it's a really real thing. But the answer then is just the gospel, not do more, but, but just receive. Go, go and talk to your, your pastor. Honestly, talk to a counselor because in the same way, like it's not your pastor's job to pray away a broken arm. He, he should pray for you but you also, you also go to the doctor in the same way. It's, it's okay to have a counselor who you go to, to to address your mind. Now, your pastor should address your soul. Your counselor should address your mind. Your, your, your doctor should address your body and everybody should stay in their lane. If your counselor is telling you things for your soul, that's bad. In the same way that your pastor's not a trained counselor. And so he might have to stay in his lane too and address the things of your soul and say, it would also probably be good if you talk to somebody about just sort of strategies for overcoming a panic attack because they're useful ones. They're, they're actually clinical things that, that can help with this so that you don't feel so alone in the middle of it because God actually is caring for you, for your mind through somebody who was given the vocation to do that. And that's God healing in, in the same way, even if, even if they, they are not a, a Lutheran or sometimes even a Christian. Because it, it, a good counselor, a good counselor should not impose Christ, but, but should impose mental wellness. A good pastor must impose Christ. And if the counselor is telling you we need less Christ, that's a bad counselor. Yeah. But, but also, I don't know that I would want a Baptist counselor who didn't understand sin the same way I did, who told me that the, the cure for my depression is just to pray more. Like, I've been praying, buddy, and it's not helping. So, so can, we, can we talk? Um, <laughs> But, but in all of it, um, I, I think it's really important to recognize this is allowed. It, it's not good. It, 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 it's not. Like, you can feel it. it it's not good. But it, it's allowed. Sin is, is allowed to, to hurt. But it's not allowed to win the day. Christ wins the day. And, and so the, the final answer to this is always and over and over and over again. Christ was crucified for you. You are baptized. You, you might not feel it, but you are worthy of love. You, you might not know what to do, but, but the path all the way to the resurrection has already been paved. And, and when it feels completely helpless, Christ is still risen. So we're going to focus on that. And that's where the ultimate comfort really lies, too. Amen. This is a heavy one, but thank you. Thank you. We'll talk again soon? Yeah, for sure. All right. We'll see ya.